Well, good morning, Pathway. Would you all stand and worship with us? But before we do, would you turn and greet someone around you? Introduce yourself.
a special time of year that we get to worship together to Christmas songs that have been around for so long and they are just so rich in what they have to say. And the next song we're going to sing is called The Lord Will Provide and which is Jehovah Jireh The Lord Will Provide. And I just think it's so beautiful that in this season when we look at provision, I think oftentimes we think of it as things like stuff, financial provision or just maybe an answer to something. When in reality, the greatest provision of all is Christ himself. And we get to celebrate that over the Christmas season. God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. And so as we sing this next song, I'm going to read just a portion of scripture. The song is fully out of Matthew 6. And so I'm going to read just a part of it for us just to kind of sit on before we read this, that we would find that he is the one that we're looking for, not what he gives us or what he has to offer other than himself and his character is trustworthy and reliable and faithful when we're faithless so many other things but let's just focus on this do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Look at the stairs. 
so good to worship together in this place and as we continue in that spirit we have an opportunity today to receive communion together and here at pathway we practice open communion that means that if you have a relationship with jesus we would love for you to receive communion the bread and the juice with us in fact if you didn't get yours when you came in we've got some team members they're going to come down the aisles and they'll kind of they'll have some baskets just wave at them and they'll throw them at you and we'll see how good you can catch them this morning no, I tell you what, communion is it's a tangible way that God can take us back to the death of Jesus and what he did for us. In fact, the Apostle Paul sets it up for us this way in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then Paul says to us, he says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, as I thought about this this morning, I found myself asking God. I was just my own heart saying, Lord, would you take me back to what this is really for. God, would you remind me, not what the bread and the juice is for, but what your death was for. And I don't know, maybe that sounds like just a simple question, and as you think about it yourself, you probably have an answer. You know, like, what was this for? Maybe in your own heart, you find yourself saying, this was for my sin. Others of us, you might have thought of the word forgiveness. Probably a lot of us, we thought, you know, Jesus' death was, was for and is for eternal life. And I'm here with you telling you all of those are right. All of those are true. That's exactly what this was for. But I was thinking about Jesus' words at that Last Supper when he's with his disciples just before he went to the cross. And he gave us a different answer, maybe even a simpler answer. Maybe you caught it as we read it. He said... Uh, that he took bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is for you I mean how simple is that but maybe God could just take us back to it hearing the words of our Savior say this is for you I died for you and I love you and I rose from the grave to give you that hope to give you the promise of eternity and as we sit here today, as we worship together in this place, all that forgiveness and all of that love and all of that hope, let's remember Jesus came to give it for you. And so I'd love for you with me this morning, just take your elements and flip it over to the smaller side and we'll peel back that white layer and take out that bread. And then would you just pray with me? Father in heaven, as we approach you this morning, Lord, thank you for the simplicity of your heart, of the reminder that what you did on the cross for each and every one of us, you've come to us saying it was for you. Lord, we praise you that you loved us so much that you gave your one and only son. And so together this morning, we remember you, Jesus, giving your body and saying to us, this is for you. Let's receive the bread together. And oh Lord, we don't forget 
your suffering, that you were crucified, that your blood was poured out, and that as you said at that last supper, your blood was given for the forgiveness of sins for many. And so, Lord, as we take this this morning, we thank you and we remember, Jesus, your love poured out for us. Let's receive the juice together. So, Lord, would you continue to work in us this morning? Would you lead our hearts back to you? Would you stir us up for your name? And would you work in us more and more of your purpose and your love? It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, we want to continue to gather in worship today as we also have an opportunity to give. And you'll see some ways on the screen that you can make giving a part of your worship in this place. And really every year as we come to the end of the year, we know that one of the ways that God works so powerfully is through what we just call year-end giving. And there are so many where God will just prompt your heart to say, I'm going to be extra generous to the kingdom of heaven right here at the end of the year. And we want you to know this year that all of your giving this month, this whole month of December, is going to go to several different places. In fact, you can see in your handout that you were given uh, eight different places that your giving is going to go to support, two of which are here at Pathway, but six are outside of our walls. And we're always asking God, God, show us how we can be generous to you here, near, and far. And so as we approach the end of the year, we just invite you to continue to pray and say, God, how can I make a difference joining with my church in worship of you, just being generous, all of us together? I believe God's going to do something amazing. We also want you to know that our giving tree ministry is kind of coming to a close. So if you took one of the tags off our giving tree, we need your gift as soon as you can get it to us. If you didn't bring it back today, just bring it to the Pathway offices as soon as you can this week. It's so amazing what God is doing there because we're serving a record number of families this year through the Giving Tree, and that means there are more tags still available. So if you'd like, if God would nudge you this morning, you can grab a tag and just bring the gift to the Pathway office and just help us serve as many families in need as we can this year. We would love that. And if you have any questions, the information on who to contact is on the back of your Giving Tree tag. We also want to make sure that you are taking a look at our Christmas Eve service times. We cannot wait to come together December 23rd and 24th. God's going to do something amazing here in this place. And we just want you to take a look and have a plan for when you can attend with us and when you can join us together as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ as a church. But you'll also notice that in your handout there are some invite cards. And we want to encourage and challenge you to just be thinking this Christmas, who might God put on your heart to invite in to our church this Christmas Eve? Who might God want you to just hand a card to? We believe God has called us as a church to love people to Jesus one at a time. And that one that God has given you, let's reach out to them together this year. Just give them an invite. And who knows, God might change their whole life. I'd love to invite our team who's serving us this morning to come, and as they come, I'd love to pray as we prepare to receive our offering together. Lord Jesus, again, we give you thanks for the good work that you're doing, for the way that you're moving, and we pray, Lord, as we continue in this time, that you'd open our hearts to your word, and that as we give, Lord, would you take it and use it and move all around the world. God, we praise you, we love you, and we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, as those buckets go through the rows, we want to get ready to jump into God's Word together. I'd love for you to take out your notes, get out your Bible, because this is week number two of our series called Anticipation. everybody. Well, last week, Steve was with us uh, to kick this series off on anticipation and did just a great job taking us into a wonderful life. And he had that cold, you know, that cold issue that kept us throwing at play. And then we went out for dinner and I think he gave it to me. Uh, it's not been a wonderful week. I'm just going to tell you that right now. And, uh, <laughs> and man, I, I, I got to Thursday. I started feeling it Friday. I really felt it. Yesterday, I really felt it. Last night, I took a little bit of NyQuil and NyQuil does not work for me. I should know this. I was up multiple times in the night. At one point, I go into the bathroom, and Tammy must have moved the door because I hit my head right on the frame of the door. Uh, head wounds, bleeding everywhere, you know. And uh, just, uh, you know, just one of those days. So here I am. Here we are together. I'll keep a distance from you. 
You keep a distance from me, and, uh, and we'll be good. Yeah, so we are talking about just this Advent, talking about uh, hope and joy and love. And, and this morning, I want us to walk into the subject of peace, a uh, real important subject. You know, there's 790 verses on peace within Scripture, 790. And, uh, and one of the verses that we tend to look at at Christmas time is this prophecy that, that is given to us out of Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. It really proclaims the fact the Messiah was going to come, and this is who the Messiah is, and it says, for, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He's going he's gonna to hold it all together is what he's going to do. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor. And I, I love this verse because I don't know about you, but I know that for me, there are times when I've needed a wonderful counselor in my life. There are times when I needed wisdom in my life. I needed others to speak in my life. But what I'm so thankful for here, too, is that, that God speaks, too, through the, through the presence of the Spirit of God within your life, that, that he speaks wisdom to you, speaks wisdom through, your, through his word to you, counsels us that way. He's a mighty God. There's nothing that can, can stop him. Um, you know, I remember when our kids were little, uh, they, would get, they would become afraid of storms. They had this fear of storms and uh, would walk into their room and, you know, they'd be crying and, and at their wit's end and... There's a little song they learned here at Pathway in Kid City uh, called uh, Mighty God. My God is so strong, so big and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And we'd sing that over and over again. I'd walk out of the room, and I don't think it mattered to them one bit. But uh, with that understanding of a mighty God, that he can hold this together, that he's an everlasting father, that he's actually, he's actually the father of eternity is the better way to, to, to phrase that, to parse that out, is the father of eternity. And he is the prince of peace. And, uh, and we all need peace, and we have different areas of our life in which we long to find peace in, and, and, uh, and what's true here is that when we look at our world and all that's around it, what we do know is this, we know of the greatness of his government, there'll be no end, one day, one day we will have peace, and then he goes on and he says, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God is going to accomplish this, is what's being said there. He's not going to stop until it's all done. It's going to happen. But it says he will reign on David's throne. Let's see how interactive this crowd is compared to last night. Uh, they were a bunch of deadbeats. Uh, but uh, um, it says he will reign. Who is he? Jesus. Yeah, thank you. Jesus. Uh, last night, nobody said anything. I'm sitting there thinking, this is an easy question, you know. It's like the kid in Sunday school class when the Sunday school teacher asked him to, you know, they, she, she, she describes a four-legged, you know, something that's got four legs and a tail and is brown and runs up trees. And, and uh, she said, what is that called? And he thought, well, I'm in church. I'm in Sunday school. He said, Jesus? She said, no, it's, it's a squirrel. That's what it is. But you got it right. You know, so where does he, you know, the question I really have for you then is when it comes to Jesus, where does Jesus reign with you? Where does he reign in you? Because the big idea this morning is this, and that is that peace leads me when Jesus reigns in my life. It leads me. I, I'm led with peace, and, and, uh, and we're really when you think about the ministry of Jesus, it, it was always focused on this element of peace, of bringing peace in the lives of others, of of bringing peace in the midst of circumstances, of bringing, bringing peace in the midst of hope, of giving hope and allowing that to be peace. And even at the end, uh, towards the end of his life, you know, that, that moment when he's in that upper room, there's that upper room discourse that is given to us in John. And Jesus is telling the disciples about what is going to happen. And I'm sure there was a lot of awkwardness in the space in the room at that time, wondering what exactly is going to happen here. And then Jesus looks at them, and I think with eyes of compassion and with kindness and with mercy. And he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And really what Jesus is saying here is this, that the peace that I give you is not based on circumstances or on what the world offers you. It is not shifty or fragile. The peace that I give you comes from God and is the only certain peace that you can have that is secure. When we think about peace, 
uh, within Scripture, we think about the word shalom. You know, shalom, you know, a peace to you more or less. But shalom is not just simply a greeting. Shalom is an understanding of this all-encompassing wholeness because of God. It actually, it actually is a lack of anxiety. It's a state of being settled with God and, and with others as well. And we think about the peace that God offers to us within the context of scriptures. There's really four kinds of peace. There's spiritual peace. There's relational peace. There's internal or emotional peace. And there is eternal peace. And I wanna talk just very briefly about those four. The first is this, and that is that we are offered a peace with God, a peace with God. And, uh, and what I want to do in these next few moments is we're going to look into Romans 5. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Romans 5, feel free to do that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look into Romans 5, and I'm just going to help you kind of walk our way through these first 11 verses. And uh, we're going to let the Scripture speak to us is what we're going to do. I think a lot of times Romans can be a hard book to kind of get your head wrapped around sometimes, but... Yeah, when you read it, when you read it with slowness and intention, and and uh, actually the beauty of the beauty of it comes into play, and and uh, there's a lot that Paul has to say to us about the peace with God. He said, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. He said, as a believer in Christ Jesus as you understand the truth of what Jesus Christ has done for you and what he did for you on Calvary and you receive that work on faith, not based on what you did, not based on what you've done, but based on what he did for you, that when you make that decision to receive that forgiveness, to, to allow him to enter into your life as your Lord, your Savior, and your King, it says to us that we are then justified through that faith. And we have this sense of this peace with God. That, that understanding of justified is really simply put this way that not guilty and full righteous. You are no longer looked upon as being guilty. God doesn't look at you with eyes and say, you're still guilty, you're still guilty, you're still guilty. He looks at you and says, hey, fully righteous in that moment. And not only that, but we have, we have this sense of, of, of access to God because of the faith that we have put into Jesus Christ in which we now stand, full access. And then Paul goes on and he says, verses six through eight, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And this should cause all of us to wrestle a little bit, because this feels offensive. And you know what? The gospel is offensive in and of itself. You don't have to be offensive with it, but at times it, 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 it feels offensive. But it's offensive in the sense of getting to understand exactly what Christ did. And Christ died for the ungodly. This is very rarely, Paul kind of kind does a little bit of, kind of a play on words here for a degree, and very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That we needed a savior. That we needed to deal with this sin issue. That God was gonna deal with it once and forever, and he was going to send, he was gonna send his son, Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, to be that lamb of God, to pour out his blood for you and for me, and, uh, and so that we could actually be in right standing with him, right standing, righteousness, justified, not guilty, fully righteous. It's really good news. Romans 5, 9 through 10 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't have to fear the wrath of God. You know, you've received Christ in your life, you know, there's, there's not a sense of wondering what's going to happen when I die. You're not going to, you're going to, if you're not going to impact, be impacted by the wrath of God. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? It's really, it's really a, just a powerful passage. You know, what's Paul telling us here? Telling us several things. I don't have the list for you on the screen. It's okay. Uh, it says that you're justified in your standing. You're, just, you're justified in your standing before God. Again, not guilty, fully righteous. That because of what Christ did for you, you have access to God. 
Because of what Christ did for you, you have the hope, the only kind of hope that God can offer you, an eternal hope. Because of what Christ has done for you, you understand the depth of God's love for you and that you are loved, that you are reconciled to God, to your creator. You're reconciled to the, to the wonderful counselor, the almighty God, the everlasting father. You are, you are, you are, uh, you are no longer his enemy. But you're looked upon now as being that saint and being holy and being a son and a daughter and redeemed. And you're looked upon as being his friend. And you no longer face his wrath. You have peace with God. You are reconciled and restored back into that right relationship with God. Amen. God is for you. So for those of you that are followers of Jesus... What I want to say to you this morning is, be at peace. So be at peace. Now to get you, look what he's done for you. And walk in an understanding that that God is for me, he's not against me. And there may be those seasons in your life when you're, you're going through a very difficult, challenging season. God is still for you in the midst of all that. Last week, we, we baptized uh, 39, 39 people last week. It was awesome, yeah. And uh, when you think about it, I mean, I love, I love the fact we've got young and, and uh, seeing the faces of some of our students is just really, really precious and meaningful and powerful. I love the expression and there's stories here, amazing stories of transformation. And when I was looking through those pictures this week and thinking about those, those 39, I, I thought about the fact that that, that uh, those 39, I mean, they, they've come to a point of understanding what Christ has done for them. They've received his grace, and they are displaying the fact that I have peace with God in this moment. We actually baptized 39 and three quarters, because I baptized a family after the service was over. I did a wedding, and then I came downstairs, and I baptized a family. And uh, when I baptized um, the daughter and her husband, uh, he told me, hey, Cree is, is uh, she's pregnant. I said, oh. I said, how far along is she? Well, how far along are you? She said, I'm doing March. I said, oh, that's like three quarters. So we got 39 and three quarters. It's the best you're going to get this morning. Uh, but the thing about this is that when you look at their faces, there is an element of peace that's there. I have peace with God. Are you thankful for that this morning? <laughs> yeah, you should applaud that this morning. I hope that you are. And then out of that, we can have peace with, we can have peace with people. Uh, how many of you are going to spend some time at Christmas with someone who you might not have peace with? Yeah, someone who, uh, who maybe just gets under your skin, anybody? Yeah, be careful, be careful. You know, may, maybe you're gonna go to the Griswold's house and you're thinking to yourself, man, I just don't wanna spend a whole lot of time with them. And uh, so you're thinking through that, you know, what do I do with that? And uh, peace with people. Yeah, there they are. You know, or maybe a long lost son shows up and you're thinking to yourself, what, what am I going to do now in the midst of all this? I mean, that would be absolutely crazy, you know, but the truth is that we all do. And, and if truth be told this morning, there are some of us in this room right now that we're living in the turbulence of some relational break, breakdown. It might be a marriage It may be a friendship, it may be a conflict between you and your kids or you and your parents. It could be a conflict at work and you're living at war and there's absolutely no peace, there's no shalom in your life. We live in a world full of conflict. I mean, I read the news this morning about Syria and that Assad has been, he's he's run from Syria now and it's hard telling what that's gonna mean for, for that part of the world. In fact, the Society of International Law states that during the last 4,000 years, there have been only 268 years of peace in spite of peace treaties. In the last three centuries, there have been 286 wars on the continent of Europe alone. Currently, currently, there are 110 armed conflicts in our world. There are 45 in the Middle East and Africa. There are six in Latin America. There are seven in Europe. There are 21 in Asia. And there are 35 in Africa. And when you look back over the years, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, of a, just kind of a war buff, and, and uh, not that I find glory in war, but I'm, 
always intrigued by what happened and what's gone on and, and some of the stories that come out of it. And there are these stories, actually, when, when a battle was going on between, obviously, two enemies, and they made a decision on Christmas Eve to stop the battle and to come together. The Treaty of Ghent in 1814 between the U.S. and U.K. was signed on Christmas Eve. The Siege of Jerusalem in 1917, General Edmund Allenby, and he overtook the Ottoman Empire. He walked into Jerusalem, making certain that when he walked in, he did not want any of the holy artifacts destroyed. Christmas Eve. World War II, there's a story in the Hurtgun Forest, the Battle of the Bulge, which was a horrific, horrific battle. And uh, there was a lady, a widow, and her son who found refuge in a little cabin in the forest. On Christmas Eve, she got a knock on the door, and when she opened it up, there were three young American soldiers that were there, one that was badly wounded. And she invited them in, she got them in, and, and, uh, and she told them, I will, you know, I will fix you something to eat, and you can just stay here for the evening. They had gotten lost from their, from their uh, unit. And it wasn't long before she got another knock on the door. She opened it up, and it was three German soldiers. So there were 24, the oldest was 24, the other two were 16. And she invited them in, and, and obviously there was tension immediately once they saw the Americans, and, and she said, I'm not going to have any of that here. We're not going to do any of that here. I will feed you, I will take care of you, but we are not going to fight in my home. And her son took the guns outside and came back in, and she fixed, she fixed a, a little dinner for all of them, and, and, uh, and the one German bandaged up the wounds of the American, and as they sat down at the dinner table to pray, she just simply prayed one simple prayer. Come here, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Christmas Eve, Jesus brings peace. There's, there's a true story, this story as well, 1914 with the Brits and the Germans, World War I, where there is actual truce that takes place on Christmas Eve. In the midst of a battle, these young soldiers make a decision that maybe we can just stop fighting and be friends for a moment. This is what happened. A little bit of a glimpse as to what happened. Jenkins, I'm clean. No. Jim? Jim, no, don't do it! Halt! Es nicht bewaffnet! Nein, Otto! My name is Jim. My name is Otto. Pleased to meet you, Otto. Freut mich. Rose, she's called. Um, it's schön. Um, it's schön.
Danke. Happy Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13, he said, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God and love, the God of love and peace, he will be, he will be with you. We're told in Ephesians that we're to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And, and uh, in other words, that if you've been forgiven, you can forgive. You can forgive. Doesn't mean that things will be restored as they always were, always was before. It doesn't mean there may not be some boundaries put in place, but, but you can forgive. And sometimes when the battle is so heated, there's sometimes when you need to make the decision that, God, I'm willing to forgive, but in that moment, what you simply need to do is let the Lord have them. Say, God, I'm going to turn this one over to you. I'm going to turn her and him, her or him over to you. Remember that moment in... And with David and Saul, when Saul's in the, in the cave and David gets in, he cuts, the, cuts his robe. And, and then in, in verse 24 of, uh, of 1 Samuel, he says, May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me on you, but my, by my hand shall not be against you. In other words, I'm giving you over to the Lord on this one. We can have peace with God, we can have peace with others, and we can have peace in me. Um, I find it interesting that there was a report that was put out just last week, matter of fact, somebody sent me an article through the Wall Street Journal of, of how many Bibles are being purchased in the, U- in the United States. That so far, so far up until October, there were 14 million Bibles purchased in the United States. And what they're saying is that a lot of it comes from some younger people. There seems to be an uptick uh, of just deep interest that's there. But people are looking for some peace, they're, they're looking for some hope. And, uh, and when you think about Christmas, I think for all of us this morning, we think about peace, what don't you feel peace about this Christmas? I mean, sometimes I think we try to worry our way to peace. And, uh, and if we're the ones who are basically kind of sitting on the throne of our life, and we've kind of pushed Jesus out, and those worries and those struggles, those temptations, those trials and whatever else come into our life, we're going to try to settle that on our own. I mean, it just is going to actually add to a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, and no real order. But when you invite Christ into the midst of the situation, and you begin to rely on him in those moments that make you incredibly anxious, full of worry, suddenly you begin to, you begin to lean into his provisions, You realize that in this moment, what is God teaching me here in this moment? What is he developing in me? Maybe it's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Maybe it's revealing the fact of, God, this is how you've provided for me in the past. I know you'll provide for me right now. It's looking at the ways in which you understand the power of your God and the fact that he's capable of doing all things and the provisions of your God and the plan of God that... That, uh, that he's going to work this out, and he's going to bring some good in the midst of all of it as well. Um, you know, that's, that's really, I, I love what Philippians says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, where Paul writes, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, prayer and supplication, and thank him for all that he's done. And then you will experience God's peace, which extends anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. He's saying, don't worry. That's a command, actually. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Bring it before the Lord. And then tell God what you need. This is where I need you at in this moment. And then thank him for all that he's done. Reflect back on the ways in which God has been providing for you each and every step of the way. Uh, There's a book that someone gave me called Throw the First Punch by Beth Gutenberger. It's a really good book talks about this and how she battles this particular area. And she says, I want to use exactly what the devil is trying against me 
and instead use it against him. If I'm anxious about a child, I want to invest time and intercession for him or her. If I'm anxious about next steps, I want to use the opportunity to reflect on where God has brought me from and the biblical principles he has for me in the future. Worry is just meditation in the wrong direction. If I can flip the script, I get positive mileage out of whatever is triggering me. If I'm worried about my health, I can thank God for how my body is working. If I'm worried about money, I can, become, I can recount past provisions and rejoice in how he has provided don't pray, ask, thank. Thank. And, and Scripture tells us that, that if we do that, Scripture tells us that Jesus will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. It surpasses our human capacity to explain. You've got a confused heart, guiding peace. If you've got an ashamed heart, forgiving peace. If you've got a worried heart, confident peace. If you have a broken heart, comforting peace. It provides all those. Let me give you the last, and we're done. And it's peace forever. It's peace forever. <laughs> um, already we reflected on this verse a little bit today, just through the songs and through the worship. And worship was really good this morning, wasn't it? It was just really good this morning. And, uh, you know, I love this. This is the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I mean, that's the gospel. The fact that, that God loved you, that he sent his son Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, to come to this earth is that perfect sacrifice for your sins so that through faith you could receive that gift and be justified and found righteous in his sight, that, uh, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's, it's, uh, it's this understanding of peace forever that, that we're told within Scripture that the only way to have this peace forever, forever, for all of eternity is what God offers us through Christ. God made the plan for restoration and reconciliation back to him simple and easy. Jesus Christ goes to the cross, pours out his blood for you and for me, uh, rise, rises from the dead, conquers that death peace, is alive and well, and that we serve a risen Savior, that he wants, he wants to forgive us and he wants to restore us into a right relationship with God for all of eternity. Eternal life. A few weeks ago, I, was, I uh, came across an article about Al Pacino. He doesn't look quite as young as he used to, does he? And uh, Pacino had a near-death experience. And he wrote about the near-death experience. And as I, as I read it, I read it, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then I thought about it. I just kept thinking about it. I thought, that's what he said. He said, I didn't see the white light or anything. There's nothing there. As Hamlet says, to be or not to be, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. But you know actors, it sounds good to say I died once. What is it when there's no more? He said, you don't have to be afraid of death. It's nothingness, is what he said. It's nothing. And, and then I thought about that, and I thought, as I'm walking through this, and even Tammy and I talked about it, I thought to myself, that would absolutely be hell. Eternity in nothingness. No one around me, no relationships, complete isolation. That would be, that'd be hell is what that would be. And, uh, you know, I, when I think about what Christ offers to us, this eternity of, of being in God's presence, this eternity of being with him for all of eternity, heaven I think is going to be amazing is what it's going to be. That gives us a sense of his peace. Um, on Monday, I don't know if they're here or not, but uh, Tim and Carol Bresahan have been around Pathway for a few years. I've known, I've known them for years, uh, since, uh, since the early 90s. Um, Toddy Turk, Christy Turk, it's Chris's mom and dad. And uh, so after service last week, um, I was out here and, and Tim said, hey, I'm going to have surgery tomorrow. And a little surgery. And he said, you know, kind of my age, if you go under, you don't always know. And so I prayed with him in a real tender moment. And uh, I said, would you mind if I came up tomorrow and just kind of had a time of prayer with you before surgery? And he said, great. So I went up on Monday and I walk in the room and they're kind of doing, you know, getting him situated, getting his charts all, 
all uh, tallied up and, and caught up. And he's sitting there, and, and, uh, and so um, one of the nurses came in and gave him some blankets, and that was good. And then something was said, something was exchanged. Basically, Tim said, well, he said, I'm okay. I, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And uh, then there was a response, and, um, and it just really emotionally, um, just emotional for him. And... So the guy taking his, his information, Tim, uh, Tim looked up at him and he said, um, do you know the Lord? And he said, what? He said, do you know the Lord? And he walked over and kind of put his arm on Tim and he said, yeah, I know the Lord. He said, so if you were to die today, would you, would you go to heaven? And he said, absolutely. He said, good. He said, you know, you probably shouldn't go a day without asking someone that question. And then I'm feeling really guilty in that moment, you know. Incredibly powerful moment. You don't know. You never know. And I'm not one to manipulate you for, uh, but I'm here to tell you that the truth is that none of us know. Our days are numbered. And when we have entrusted ourselves to the Lord's leadership in our life, our eternity is set. We have peace with God. We have peace with others. Peace in me and peace forever. Let's stand together, shall we? Let me pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I am so grateful uh, for, um, for reminding me of the peace that, that you've given to me. That through this study and through just kind of thinking through what to say, just a, another reminder to me of peace with you, of, um, of peace in me. The fact that I can have peace with others and the fact is that, that I, I know that I know that I know that I will have peace for all of eternity. And there will be some in the space this morning that they've never come to the place of, of acknowledging that. They've never acknowledged and just simply said in a very humble way that, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm sitting at the center of my life on that throne, not you. And that I'm a sinner and he's a savior. And I ask you right now to forgive my sin and to enter into my life and to begin to sit on the throne of my life. Thank you for going to the cross, paying the penalty for my sins. I believe, Lord, that you are alive and well. And that, Lord, um, you are offering me a life that is full through the work of your salvation in my life. And I receive you today. As my Savior. Lord Jesus, I, I just pray that for those in this space this morning that may have done that, that they would just have the courage after the service to walk down the front and just allow someone who is here to pray with them just to affirm them and encourage them, give them something. There may be some here this morning that they're still in that, that season of questioning all of this. That's good. I'm glad they're here. Lord, I just pray you just continue to encourage them to keep seeking. Thank you, Lord, for the certainty we have in you, the certainty of the peace that you offer to each and every one of us. We're grateful. We love you. That's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you're a guest this morning, just thank you for being here. Stop by guest services. There'll be some folks down front. Love to pray with you this morning as well. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you later.